Welcome to Worldwide Bible Class. Pastor Wolfmuller here. The life of Jacob with Martin Luther. We are, we're just at this beautiful spot. It, it goes from beautiful to ugly in one quick verse. It's just amazing. It's uh, We're right here where Jacob in verse 20. So we're in... Uh, we're in uh, G- Genesis 29, verse 20. Jacob served for seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him only a few days because of the love that he had for her. So that this is a beautiful. It, so Jacob is working, serving Laban, his uncle, seven years, and it's it's, it's like a snap. It's over, and then it, and then he comes time to. Uh, for the wedding he had this great love for rachel he's just he's so excited about this and now it's time for the wedding and we're all excited too because i mean here's jacob who's had a pretty rough time of it right i mean he he's 80 years old now or something like that 70 no 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 77 78 plus five he's 85 years old never been married he's had he's had the promise that He'll have this big family, but so far, no luck. He was in exile, running from his brother who was going to murder him. And he happens across his family, Laban, and Rachel, the younger daughter, and falls madly in love with her. And so, so, so deep is his love and affection for Rachel that it's like a snap. Uh Uh-oh, did I lose you guys? It's just, I mean, just a moment, and it's, uh, and and it's, um, hmm, uh huh, uh huh. I did lose you guys, didn't I? Uh oh. Uh Okay, you guys are there. Okay, so. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, so, so that's just this, this kind of marvelous, wonderful, beautiful, delightful picture of how it goes with, uh, with Jacob and Rachel. And then all of a sudden, Laban's going to just pull the rug out. Whack. Whack. Uh, well, out of a, a love for a charming and beautiful maiden, he endures such a long and hard servitude. And from this one, can gather how great his love is. And one should note that Holy Scripture does not condemn, but praises this love in the bridegroom. But what follows is an outstanding and brilliant example of Jacob's patience and servitude and in love for the maiden and his love for the maiden. So, so then Jacob said to Laban, so, here's, so he's, he worked for seven years and you know, without saying a word, seven years. And then Jacob says to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. Now, this is not like, (laughs) you know, my years are fulfilled. Jacob here is counting the days. Uh, Luther's going to note that he calls her a wife, and this is the uh, sort of a a biblical thing that that, uh, that even a, a, an engaged woman can be named a wife. Scripture does not distinguish between a wife and a betrothed woman. This is seen here in Moses and also in Matthew, where betrothed virgins are called wives. Remember Mary and Joseph. So there's a difference between the betrothal and the wedding because that wedding authorizes marital intimacy and so forth and so on. But when you're betrayed, you're when you're betrothed, you're you're halfway there. And so there's a one Hebrew and one Greek word that kind of handles both of those. Uh, we don't have that betrothal engagement for us is not a betrothal. It, I think it used to be. If you go back a couple of generations in the United States, some, some of you might know that and can inform me in the chat that there used to be a, a higher esteem for betrothal. Anyway, therefore, Jacob regards Rachel as his lawful wife, and he burns with true marital love toward her, as a young man and bridegroom are wont to do. But the ardor of the bridegroom is strongest when the time for embracing and copulating draws near. 
the, in this patriarch of ours, however, this very pure and ardent love toward his wife, Rachel, is, is most shamefully disturbed, as is stated next. So here's what happens. So Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And in and, and here, we are going to see Luther raging against Laban. I mean, you think that it's almost as if, I mean, if Laban would have been there, you know, Luther would have just punched him in the face. He's so, he's so enraged at him. The scoundrel would deserve to be cursed into the abyss of hell. <laughs> Moses does not say he called and invited men to the nuptial feast, which is customarily done solemnly in an honorable manner, but rather that he gathered together, he raked together in the Hebrew, this idea is he's, uh, he's, he's raking together, kind of just, the, the, the picture here is Laban is a really sort of trashy guy, and, and he's a scoundrel, he, and he doesn't do things right, he does things for his own interest, and he sees now, and it's, apparently he's plotted here, that Jacob has been a benefit to him, he didn't start out with anything, and Jacob being there for seven years has increased his, his wealth and his prosperity and everything else like this, and so he's saying, what if I give, if, if Jacob marries Rachel, then he'll leave and I'll be without Rachel. I'll be without Jacob now. So I'll, here's what I'll do. I'll get all my buddies and I'll get them together. And then I'll give Jacob Leah instead of Rachel. I'll fool them. And then I'll have them for another seven years because it's, you know, it's going to be Laban's idea. Well, why don't you stick around for another seven? He called invited men. He raked together, not for the glory and honor of the bridegroom and the bride, which is why a father has a wedding to, to give glory and to give honor to the groom and to the bride, Bri bridegroom. I, I like to, we just say groom now, but I think bridegroom is nice <laughs> because you can't have a bride, bride or a groom, groom. You have to have a bridegroom and a bride. And anyway, he calls together and it's, and, uh, that this is why we have this wedding to honor them. But rather Laban does it to deceive and make sport of the very pious and saintly man in order that he might hold him captive with his tricks, lest in any way he be able to repudiate and exchange the woman with whom he cohabitated that night, even though he had been deceived and deluded. Therefore, he suddenly collects a bunch of witnesses. And I just want to read through this because there's not a lot of theological point, but just Luther's commentary on what happened. So we'll read pretty quickly. Therefore, he gathers together uh, a number of witnesses. And scripture seems to hint that Laban did not have a good reputation among his pious and honorable neighbors, who undoubtedly understood his evil wiles and all the wrongs he inflicted on the pious and faithful Jacob during those seven years. It had to been embarrassing to watch. And here you're having this man slaving away from you for you for seven years, just, to, you're not paying him, you're not giving him anything. You just promised to give him your daughter in marriage, and he doesn't even think of it. Jacob doesn't even, can't even imagine anything else. Therefore, he collected fickle people who would not disapprove of this imposture. This means he was an exceedingly evil old fox, completely ruined by greed. Jacob, however, joyfully aglow with love toward his Rachel, suspects nothing wrong or evil, but full of hope and joy, he waits for his very charming bride in order that he might have pleasure in the joy he has hoped for and desired for such a long time. I mean, not only seven years, but 85 years. This is the picture. Pretty amazing. So in the evening, he took his daughter, this is Laban, verse 23. In the evening, he took his daughter, Leah, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Now, I want to I, I make the point here that... Wait a minute. I want to make the point that... There we are. That that Jacob. Uh, most people, when they when they read this text, will point out how Jacob is getting what he deserved. How turnaround is fair play. How Jacob received. How Jacob deceived Isaac, and now Jacob himself is being deceived. 
And that is a million miles from Luther's mind when he looks at Jacob. This is why I think one of the reasons, and just to point this out as we go along, one of the reasons why it's so stunning to study Luther and how he thinks of these things, how he thinks of Jacob. He, he really puts the best construction on Jacob, that Jacob is a saintly and faithful man. And that the deception that happened to get him the blessing was required by the impertinence of Esau and Isaac. And so now, rather than understanding this as turnabout, it's just, con- it's, uh, it's, it's a continued uh, affliction that is, that, that's coming upon Jacob. It's a continued, uh, I mean, it, uh, anyway, you see what I'm saying? It's that it, 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 Jacob is, a, is living this life of suffering. This is an example of patience. See, therefore let him who can learn patience do so. I cannot, for this is intolerable and in, 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 Timidable. Uh, Luther's going to say, you know, a lot of times Luther's going to say, look, the saintly patriarchs are given to us as an example, but, but it, it, I, I don't think we'll get to it today, but maybe at the bottom of this, uh, Luther's going to say, but you can't follow this example. You can't, this example of Jacob, there's, there's a piety that's too profound for us even to, to try to embrace. The very pious and saintly man loves the maiden so ardently that he does and endures everything for seven whole years. Indeed, he enriches that greedy old fox Laban with the stipulation and the condition that he give him his daughter Rachel in marriage. But in return for such faithful service, Laban thanks him by secretly taking away his wife. This is amazing. And the virgin whom Jacob loved and had sought and desired for so many years. And at that time, and in the very hour of marital joy, he had longed for most. Laban not only snatches her away, which of course is very annoying in itself, but he also thrusts on him another who's revolting to him. And in this way, puts a perpetual burden on his neck. And not only a perpetual burden on his neck, but also it's going to, this is going to have, uh, bad effects in the whole family and this is not just setting uh this is not just setting jacob against uh laban but also against leah and leah against rachel and the children against each other it's the whole thing gets all twisted up it's surely a horrible and exceedingly disgraceful imposture jacob knows nothing else that he has his most charming bride in his embrace, and behold, he has a substitute. If someone should take your money, gold, silver, and cattle, it's a small loss. But to take a virgin, you're, you're, you're engaged to be married, a beautiful and beloved wife, from whom you expect offspring with your whole heart, and from whom, whom you hope for the seed of the promised descendants, this is surely a wrong and an insult that surpasses all wrongs. For this whole hope and expectation of Jacob suddenly collapsed. Nor could anything other thought, nor could any other thought enter his mind that he would be deprived forever of the love of Rachel, his bride, and that she would no longer be his wife. So so that Jacob looks at this and sees not only have you done this, not only have you not brought Rachel to the wedding, but you've instead brought Leah. And that means now I'll never marry Rachel. That is the exceedingly pleasant hope and that very fond expectation of the love and embrace for his wife, which has lasted for seven whole years to the boundless joy of both is cheated. And, and Luther's going to say, this is not just Jacob that, that, uh, that was hoping for this marriage, but also Rachel. What about her? You know, what about, what about her thoughts? Does Laban not, does he have, have no thought? of the of his daughter in this they did not suffer this wrong without tears and great grief it is an evil too cruel 
too dreadful and their patience is incredible. Luther says, I surely would not have endured it, but I would have disputed with Laban and would have summoned him to court in order that he would have been compelled by the laws to give my wife back. And I would have rejected the other one and sent her back to her father. I mean, think about the, you know, the, all the guys who everyone knew that what was going on, that Jacob was, was, was working these seven years for Laban so that he could marry his daughter, Rachel. And then, and then he calls together his friends for a feast. He's like, hey, guys, watch this. And then none of them stand up and say, you, you know, to punch him in the face and say, what are you doing? This is, this is incredibly cruel. This is huh, not for Leah, but for Rachel had been betrothed to him. And this had been publicly reported and was undoubtedly known throughout the whole town. I think, however, that those whom Laban gathered together uh, as his guests were fickle and worthless fellows, good for nothing rascals, who were compelled to approve and excuse this crime to please Laban. But the separation is very hard and is intolerable. Indeed, even if I were older than Methuselah himself, I could not bear it. For this separation is contrary to nature and every human feeling. What great commotions those who snatch virgins and women have stirred up in all histories. How often have very flourishing kingdoms clashed in battle with one another because of wrongs of this kind? <laughs> and Luther's going to run through a list of a few. The abduction of Helen, the Greeks stirred up almost the whole world, the Trojan War. The Sabines went to war against the Romans because of the abduction of their daughters. And in chapter 34, the Shechemites are slain by the sons of Jacob because of the abduction of Dinah. For the feeling of love uh, in a bridegroom is most tender and impatient, especially at the very moment of marriage when the embrace and the nuptial joy are at hand. Therefore, he can endure nothing less than to have his bride torn away from him, his bride with whom he is madly in love and whom he holds dearer than gold and silver, yes, than his eyes and life itself. Furthermore, Jacob had sought and chosen this bride at the order and in accordance with the wish of his father for the sake of the promised descendants this is it. he hoped from his beautiful young bride so that this is not just this doesn't just have to do with normal being married and loving your spouse this has to do also with the with the promise with the promise of the seed The promise that the, the, the one that God gave in the garden, that the, the seed that would destroy the serpent's head. But this collapses in a moment. So does the joy that has been so long hoped for. Therefore, if anyone can magnify and excreate such outstanding and unheard of malice, let him do so. For it is too great to be expressed in any words. Indeed, reproof and, and indignation uh, where, uh, seem to be indicated in the text. For it's not said that Laban brought Leah to Jacob as his wife, as he later informs us concerning Rachel, namely that he gave his daughter Rachel as his wife. Moses does not regard it as proper to call Leah his, a wife. And he says, and he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. So this is a very interesting point, is that it's going to have to, it's going to be this question. Is it in fact a true, is it in fact a true marriage? But terrible cupidity, this means greed, I think impelled greedy Laban to commit such a great crime, not so much in order to foist his older daughter on Jacob as to detain him for seven more years. So that why, why did, and, and this is one of these things where we, we always want to, uh, we always want to look for motive when it comes to these sorts of things. It's like as we think about this, you know, you know this thing in Nashville, and as, as listening to Al Mohler this morning talk about it, that we're we, we have this this incessant desire to figure out the motive for crime, and that's right. I mean, we that doesn't excuse the crime, but it it figures out where you know where it came from. And here, the motive for Laban for doing this, what he's going to say is the motive is this isn't how we do it in, a, in here. You know, always the older daughter has to get married first. Which, you know, you could have mentioned that seven years ago. <laughs> now you don't even you don't even bring it up a couple of weeks beforehand. No. But the motive is not that the motive that he has is. Uh, is to just keep Jacob as a slave. 
he was not so much he didn't it wasn't so it wasn't just a foist his older daughter on Jacob as if as if Laban's great fatherly concern was with Leah. No, he wants to detain him for seven more years. For he's aware of the wonderful success and of the increase of his property. Therefore, it was it was shameful and horrible for this very pious man to be detained by such a monstrous crime in order to satisfy the greedy desires of this old fox. But he must suffer derision, which is really altogether too hard. How Rachel herself is felt is not told, but it's reasonable to suppose that her indignation was not less, for she undoubtedly knew that she was the bride. You know, she's had she has her wedding dress ready. She's, I mean, if a bridegroom is excited about the wedding, will you, boy, wait till you talk to the bride. I've had enough conversations with couples getting ready to get married. And, uh, and I'll say, well, are you guys ready? And the bridegroom looks at the bride and she says, yeah, we're ready. <laughs> I mean, she's doing all the work. This is. So here's Rachel who has her bridesmaids picked out and has her dress and is ready for the thing. And then Laban says, hey, you go home. She knew she was a bride. It was known to the whole neighborhood that Jacob was serving for Rachel those seven years. Therefore, she was disturbed by the wrong just as much as the bridegroom himself. Indeed, she could endure and overcome much less. The nature of her sex is weaker. She was sh sure that she was the bride and that she was to be led in the bridal chamber. But in the very hour in which she thinks she will enjoy the lo uh, love and the bridegroom she had longed for, she's most shamefully deceived not without great grief, not without tears and wailing. Accordingly, this is a sad and mournful marriage, for the bridegroom is wretchedly deceived, but Rachel the bride is rejected. Undoubtedly, she could not conceal her completely justifiable grief and indignation and gave evidence of this with her tears and her voice, which she expostulated with her father, saying, why are you taking from me my bridegroom, whom you yourself promised me? But the cruel father was not at all moved. Amazing, Laban. Perhaps he even restrained her with threats. Leah knew that she was not the bride, but the bride's sister. And perhaps she offered some resistance to the wish of her father. Yet out of human affection, she allowed herself to be taken away and to be forced to commit this wrong. Indeed, so here now talking about Leah, what, what was, what's, what's her role in this whole thing? She also knew that she was, you know, she was supposed to be an attendant at the wedding, not the bride. Indeed, she congratulated herself on this act of violence in order that she might become the mother of the promised descendants who, as she had heard, awaited, were awaited by Jacob. So what's going on with Leah in her mind that she thinks this is a good idea and that she doesn't speak up? You know, it's dark and Jacob comes into the tent and Leah says, hey, by the way, it's Leah. Not, No, she plays along. She must have played along for the whole thing to work. Therefore, this was an unfortunate marriage for Jacob and Rachel because of the unexpected deception. And in the case of the very saintly patriarch Jacob, an example of exceptional chastity in a cross and the greatest patience is set forth. For I do not know where, if any one of the saints, not to say the heathen, would have been able to bear this cross with such great patience. It's too high and too terrible. What, what would anybody, you, you take the greatest of all the people ever born, what would they do in this particular situation? And Luther says, look, it's Jacob. His patience here is just through the roof. The question is asked, what kind of nuptial rites were there among these people? For Jacob alone sleeps with her alone in the bedchamber and on the same bed, but he doesn't realize that it's Leah has been substituted for Rachel. So how were their marriage customs such that he didn't recognize this? Uh, Luther talks about how, you know, we come along with lights and torches and you actually see each other's face and you go to church first and then etc. It just must have been that the customary, they did not live so close together as is customary among us. Young men lived with their fathers, maidens with their mothers. Jacob uh, had his bride with him in his bedchamber. He surely could have conversed freely with her. He could have discovered even, uh, where is it? He could have discovered even by touching her, it wasn't Rachel. From this one gathers that in this age, there was the greatest modesty, or at least in the case of the patriarch Jacob. That, the, that, that things must have been arranged in such a way, and Luther accounts for this by the modesty of Jacob, that he is almost timid here 
and he just in he simply he embraces well leah who he thinks is rachel he enter, here, here it says, it's, there's a modesty and chastity which is the reason why this isn't discovered uh he neither spoke with her nor touched her but only embraced her with marital love out of exceedingly great joy that finally he had been able to enjoy the love of his very dear bride scripture commends this outstanding modesty and chastity he entered the bridal chamber without suspicion without lasciviousness without lewd desire with simple marital affection um consideration should be given to this great frankness and not discovering by any sign at all that the woman whom he came was a stranger for one should not look at the fathers as the papists do now this is again here uh what, what luther is challenging us to do is to think how do we look at the fathers how do we think of the fathers uh do we think of them in terms of patience, chastity, and faithful living? Or, or do we think of them as crude and whatever? This is the, 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 this is the uh, this is the real challenge of the reading the scriptures here with Luther is the way that he looks at the fathers. For it is their opinion that the fathers uh, indulge madly in lust as they themselves do. <laughs> but in Jacob, there was a very simple chastity and completely pure love toward his bride. Nor did he have any reason to suspect that another woman would have been substituted for both parents and the bride herself are very well known. And in all of them, the greatest candor and the purest sincerity has always been seen. Nevertheless, he's deceived. But this is what I think. And I excuse Jacob, as I said above, about Lot when he lay with his daughters. For it can happen that a man at times is so absorbed in strong imagination and in the application of his mind that he doesn't see, hear, or feel anything, even though he hears with open ears and sees with open eyes. We, we know this. This is what, you know, when you're focused on something and someone's talking to you and you hear that someone's talking to you, but it does not register. Or you're thinking about something and you see something, like you can see it, but it doesn't register what you're seeing. Uh, the, Luther's talking about that. In fact, he's going to go on to say that this is especially common in people who are melancholy. He talks about Lot and how he was deceived by his daughters to give them children and so forth. That must have happened there. This is strange, but it's customary in the case of a melancholic. Uh, it's natural when they give serious attention to some endeavor or to thinking about something. From a melancholic, you could often take away all his property without his knowledge, even though he himself were present. You gotta, you gotta, can you imagine this? So, so, so melancholy is probably the ancient word for depression. And can I commend that word to you, by the way? Depre it, that it's better to speak of being melancholy. Can, can, just, just imagine these two phrases. I am diagnosed with depression versus I am afflicted with melancholy. I mean, first of all, it just sounds cooler. And second of all, if you think, man, I'm diagnosed with depression, I'm good for nothing. But if I think that I'm afflicted with melancholy, then I, I think, well, so was everybody else in the world who did something important. I mean, Luther and the great theologians, they all talk about the dark night of the soul. And great artists and writers all talk about the same. So Luther's talking about, <laughs> Joey says, melancholics anonymous. That's right. And also, instead of talking about being diagnosed, to be talking about afflicted. So I, I, I have this certain temperament, and I got to fight against it. I see it as an affliction. But you, but then you can, you can work through it and recognize that it gives you some, also some benefit. To, to, there's a sensitivity in melancholy. So, and Luther talks about if you have someone and they're depressed and they're and they're sitting there thinking about something, you could steal, you could steal their house from around them, and they wouldn't even notice even if they're sitting there <laughs> in the same manner. I mean, Luther knows this from experience. Jacob's heart was occupied with and absorbed in love and joy. And he gave thanks to God because he had a bride from whom he was hoping for descendants. He was drunk, not with wine, 
but with love for Rachel, whom he had sought and desired for such a long time, seven years working, and it was like a day. This drunkenness of love is certainly great insensibility, stupefied, as it were, by this. He could not notice or feel the deceit, for he suspects nothing evil, but is completely absorbed in thought and in love. He is sure that his bride can no longer be taken from him. Therefore, nothing was further from his mind than that the old fox felt obliged to take his bride away from him and to substitute Leah. This is how I spoke above concerning Isaac when he blessed Jacob instead of Esau, although he recognized Jacob's voice and although his heart felt beforehand that treat, deceit and trickery were at hand. Nevertheless, since he was occupied with a desire to pronounce a blessing, he gives no thought even to the things he feels and hears. Such examples occur often in life. When hearts fall back from the external senses into the thoughts which they were previously occupied, and when they think that it's impossible for them to be deceived or suffer any harm, for they trust their hearts more than their eyes and their ears. Therefore, when we must think that Jacob too, drunk as he was with love, was stupefied and carried away as it were, so that he thought of nothing less than, he could, than that he could be deceived, that powerful ardor of love blinded him. This is what come to, has come to my mind about the imposture of this old fox, namely how Jacob was deceived by it. At the same time, however, that outstanding and rare example of modesty should be noted, and the chastity of the patriarch should be enlarged on over and above all the chastity and celibacy of the monks. This is a... This is a the, the, the here Luther, of course, is fighting against the idea uh, that the monks take a vow of chastity. And Luther says, OK, show me that. <laughs> show me that chastity. In what monastery? It's a crazy thing, by the way, that one of the main arguments of the Catholic apologists today against the Lutherans is that Luther started the Reformation because he was um, lusty and wanted to get married, which... It seems like if you're lusty, that's what you should do, according to the Bible. But that's what they accuse Luther of here. But I, I'm not sure that's the argument that they want to use. So that the, the, uh, the chastity of the patriarchs, here the exceedingly ardent impulses of love and lust are overcome or at least repressed in both Jacob and in Rachel. Although Rachel was the true bride. Yet she's excluded from marriage chamber for which she is hoped for and which is her due. And she's compelled to pretend that she is not the bride and to comfort and assuage the wretched love and longing for this bridegroom with her tears. Furthermore, one can see how here how the great paternal power was among those people. For Leah is compelled uh, by only one word and nod from her father Laban to take the place of Rachel and herself to become bride, even contrary to the plighted troth. The, the, uh, to the pledged truth. I, I, I've been for years, uh, the old language for the uh, wedding vows is, uh, I plight thee my troth, which is old English for I pledge to you my faithfulness, troth being faith, truth, faithfulness, plight, pledge. I pl so the plighted troth is the pledge of faithfulness, which we have in marriage. And I've been trying to talk couples into plighting their troths instead of pledging their faithfulness and finally i got a couple we're get, they're getting married in three weeks and they said we'd like to use the old the old vows plight i plight thee my troth so i got i don't know they might get scared by the time we get there but it at least ask me in uh ask me in a month if we had the plighted troth i even contrary to the pledged faithfulness for before that time, Jacob had not exchanged a single word with Leah about getting married. No love, no pledge, no agreement had intervened. But without consent, agreement, and discussion, the daughter is seized by the father and placed on the nuptial bed of Jacob. The father does not try to find out what his daughter wants. He does not hear her answer. If these were the customs of those people, they certainly were very bad. For it is certain that no betrothal was concluded. Oh, here, this is... Um, the, the, there's no betrothal concluded between Leah and Jacob and that no witnesses were summoned. In other words, this was not done in an orderly way. Will you marry me? Yes, no, et cetera, et cetera. Not, none of that. None of that comfort. None of the, any of the stuff that's supposed to happen. Everything is attended to suddenly by the tyranny and violence of the father who seizes his daughter and brings her into Jacob. 
Therefore, this is a very bad example by which we see that Leah becomes a bride by the sheer tyranny and cruel boldness of her father. Although it's reasonable to suppose that she consented readily to become the mother of the saintly posterity, and it's therefore excusable, the tyranny of the father is completely detestable. Although the saintly man tolerates this wrong, he endures it. Yet is it a detestable example that one should by no means be uh, intimated, copied. Here, Lear and others ask whether this was a true marriage that night between Leah and Jacob. I replied that it was not. Then was it adultery? By no means. What then? A monstrosity. So this is a tricky question. Was it a marriage? Well, no, not you can't call this a marriage. But can you do you call it adultery? Well, you can't call it adultery. Uh, it, it was a it was a monster. Luther just says it was just a a disaster. It was a monstrosity. It was a defilement. It was, was it sinful? Yes. But where's the guilt? Was it on Leah? Maybe a little. Was it on Jacob? No. Was it on Laban? Yes. If you look at the deed itself, Jacob is not Leah's husband, but he taints and defiles a woman who is not betrothed to him. Yet he's without guilt, but the guilt clings to faithless Laban, who deceives the bridegroom and the bride and tears the marriage asunder by uniting Jacob with another woman, than the one he had promised in marriage, and that his daughter. Ugh. He can neither be called an adulterer, Jacob, nor does he deserve to be regarded as one. And if the question is asked whether Jacob sinned by lying with a strange woman, one must reply that although the deed itself is a manifest defilement and not a marriage, yet he did not sin. In other words, he, he, he doesn't bear guilt for this, for he has been deceived by another's treachery, which he could not even suspect. Who would fear that a father would defraud his very own daughter of the joy hoped for for such a long time? The daughter had no other thought than, and look at how Luther is like bouncing around, like how it must have been with Rachel, how it must have been with Jacob, how it was with, he's, it's, you almost get the sense that he's like, he's so incensed, like it just happened yesterday and he can't believe it. He's like Luther is, you do get the sense that he's like fuming over this injustice. Would that we could read the Bible that way, that we could just be so close to it. Like, can you believe it? That it would, that it would, I mean, I don't, what is it? What is this? That it would just cause our, our minds and our hearts to, it would move us. This is how, uh, here Luther's, he's just all over the place because of his, anger here. Jacob entered with true marital love without any doubt that he would embrace Rachel, his wife, for the treacherous rascal Laban had promised us, pretended for seven whole years, but in one moment he destroys the marriage that has been pretend, uh, pretended for such a long time. This is plain rascality. Is that how to say that? Therefore, we shall reply to the proposed question by saying that there was no marriage between Jacob and Leah. For the willing consent of both was lacking. She had not been betrothed to Jacob, and Jacob was not Leah's bridegroom. But a mistake was made and it was the case of invincible ignorance in a political, uh, in a political matter. Now, this idea of invincible ignorance is a legal term. Remember, Luther went to went to law school for a couple of months, a couple of years, I suppose. And we we still have this idea of invincible ignorance that if if you if you did something and you couldn't have known any different, you can't be held guilty. Luther's going to say that that's not the case in theology because you can't but but sin, all you can do is sin, and yet you are still guilty for it. In theology, however, this idea of invincible ignorance has no validity, even though some have related to theology. But its place is only outside theology in the political sphere. It should not be adduced before the court of God, otherwise all men would be saved. Look, I, I was a sinner. I was born with sin. It's not my fault. Et cetera, et cetera. For reason does not understand it, yet this does not mean that they are excused before God. Therefore, invincible ignorance should be placed outside theology, but in the political sphere, it's complete excuse. Thus, this union of Jacob and Leah is not a marriage, and the deed, per se, is a defilement, but it is excused on the ground of invincible ignorance. Leah is also excused. She should not be regarded as a harlot. She is excused on the ground of the authority of her father, who said, uh... I bid, compel, and order you as your parent. You, Leah, are a bride on the strength of my authority and will. Now, we are obliged by the law to disobey our parents, but in these matters of compulsion, there's a, 
this is again what Luther's talking about. There's a way that the guilt doesn't stick to you, but on the one who compelled it. Therefore, she goes forth in simplicity and pure filial obedience. And although it is probable that she allowed herself to be brought without reluctance, yet she's excused on the ground of paternal power and filial obedience. But it is very hard and shameful for the father to compel her with his tyranny. And she herself does not dare refuse. Accordingly, all guilt should be cast on greedy Laban. Notice how here Luther's playing a, that trick on his name by spelling it backwards referring to Nabal, the fool who almost gets killed by King David. So, so All guilt is cast on Nabal, Laban, whose aim it was to foist both daughters and the pious man. No sin and guilt adheres to Jacob, but this is a case of pure ignorance. For without his knowledge and against his will, he's defrauded of the love of the very charming bride whom he hopes to embrace that night. Thus the Roman historians exclaim, exclude excuse their lucretia uh, uh in fact um there's the, the roman example but there's a christian example of saint lucia and this is an interesting thing that that oftentimes we don't talk about this much but in the old martyr stories there was two places where the martyrs were taken they were taken to the arena and they were taken to the brothel. And the, the Romans thought that by defiling the Christians sexually, they would destroy their purity, both men and women. So, and sometimes it was, they, they would be abused uh, sexually. Other times they would be tempted sexually. So, for example, there's the stories of the of some of the male martyrs who were brought to the brothel so to to induce a, a lustfulness in them that would defile them. It's a very so so that the Romans would would we mostly hear of them afflicting the martyrs with pain, but they would also try to afflict them then with pleasure. And, and so that would, I, I, I think it's, I mean, for both ways. So they could be, they would perhaps violate both the men and most especially the women, but they would also tempt the women, but most especially the men to sexual impurity. So this happened with Lucia, when that when the judge threatened to drag her to the altars of the idols and to the brothel, and the youths who were to defile her had already been assembled, she replied, if you seized my hands to offer incense to an idol, you are an idolater, not I. And if I am led to a brothel, I will not be a harlot on this account, but I will get a double crown of chastity. And, and this, so this is talking about when sinful things, when we are either deceived into sinning or compelled into sinning, the, the guilt does not remain ours. In the same manner, we must free the patriarch Jacob from guilt. He enters the marriage chamber out of simple marital affection. He thinks he'll find Rachel there, but contrary to every thought and wish, he's united with Leah, who has not been betrothed to him. But after his complaint, there will be a true marriage when God grants a dispensation for this union and confirms it by giving offspring, Simeon, Levi, Reuben, etc. Then, and this I think has, you guys have been commenting in the chat all along about this that's coming. It must be called, well done in order that everything the saints do may work together for their good, Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So that God sees this great deception, and he's going to work good out of it. He's going to make benefit come, even though there's going to be a lot of trouble. Also. Otherwise, it's neither marriage nor adultery. It's simply a monstrosity. Nor should this example be imitated by us. Children should not be forced to love and marry those from whom they recoil. Besides, enough and more than enough happens in the way of dangers and trouble in marriage, even if those who are aglow with love for each other are united as daily examples show. Nor has this patience been set forth for us to imitate, for it is too hard and completely heroic, namely to endure and suffer with equanimity 
that one's bride is snatched away in the very hour at the very moment of the nuptials. Therefore, one will have to admire and praise this example rather than imitate it. So Luther's saying, okay, now what do we do with the text? Certainly we don't imitate Laban here. This is utterly cruel and wicked and horrible. Uh, but neither are we called to imitate Jacob here because this patience is, is just too much. Like who could endure? Moses proceeds to describe how Jacob felt when he discovered the deceit. All right, so we got we covered a lot. So I want to actually want to stop there and stop the recording. We'll say a quick prayer, stop the recording, and then and then chat about this because now we're going to get to Jacob's reaction, and then we're going to get the conversation with with Laban and what follows. So that's a one and and here I used to think I know this was maybe from Sunday school that it was seven years working and then married to Rachel. And then seven years working and then married to Leah. But it's, it's not that way. It's seven years working, married to Rachel, one week, married to, wait, wait, seven years working, married to Leah, then one week, and then married to Rachel, and then whoosh, seven years more working. So, so we're going to get to that week and get to all that arrangements uh, here. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your, for your word. Uh, for the wisdom and comfort that you deliver to us in your word. We pray that you would keep us uh, trusting in your word, that you would grant us your spirit so that we would uh, see rightly uh, the fathers who went before us, especially Jacob, that we would understand uh, his patience and suffering as he clung to your word and promise. We thank you that in all of the uh, sinful acts uh, you worked your good for your people and most especially to establish your church and give us the confidence that you continue to work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose for we ask all these things through christ our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god world without end amen amen thanks everyone let's stop the recording